Please turn with me to 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter number 4. 2 Timothy chapter number 4. And so I want to welcome everyone to our first service in this month of February. And I want to say welcome home to everyone. That's where we are today. You are home where everyone is welcomed and embraced. And so to our one or two visitors this morning, let me just say to you, you are also welcome. And if you don't have a home church, please consider making this your home church. There aren't any other visitors here, right? About the two people. Everyone else is at? I'm one of those people where if you don't talk to me, I feel there's no one in the room. We are all at? Amen. I would be amiss to not acknowledge God first joining True North this morning as we become one church moving forward. And you hear us say this time and time and again, we are better together, stronger together. That's our refrain, that's what we'll be talking about through the whole year. Better together, stronger together. And so this morning I just want to go to the scriptures and encourage our hearts as we begin this new season of our lives. And so we'll be looking at Paul writing to his young protege, Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter number 4. Now here's a brief overview of the second letter that Paul writes. Paul is in prison in Rome and he's about to die. And he thinks of people to write to. And Timothy, his favorite, comes to mind and he writes to him. He says, Timothy, I want you to come and visit me in Rome. I'm about to depart this earth, so you are the last person I want to spend time with. So I might give you some last-minute instructions. But you see, the law at that time was not as fair as it was, as it is today. Paul didn't know whether the emperor would wake up the next day not feeling right. And if the emperor woke up on the wrong side of the bed, he might just decide to kill all the prisoners on that very day. And so he writes saying, I long for you to come to me, yet at the same time, I don't know if I'll ever see you again, so let me give you some last minute instructions. And so this morning we will spend our time in Paul's instructions to little Timmy. 2 Timothy chapter 4, reading from verse 1. I solemnly charge you before God and Christ Jesus, who is going to judge the living and the dead, and because of his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, encourage with great patience and teaching. Verse 3. For the time will come when people will not tolerate sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, they will multiply teachers for themselves because they have an itch to hear what they want to hear. They will turn away from hearing the truth and will turn aside to myths. But as for you, Timothy... Exercise self-control in everything. Endure hardship. Do the work of an, of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time for my departure is close. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Verse 8. There is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. And not only me, but to all those who have loved his appearing. So this morning, I want to analogize this text to us. So for all of you who are big Bible scholars and line-by-line uh, -line people, for this special occasion, I want to make this text read as if it was written directly to us. Okay? If you want to grade my preaching, grade it next time, not this morning. I want to massage this text into our hearts as if Paul wrote directly to us. We're going to start in verse 6. As I said, this is a bittersweet letter. And so Paul writes to Timothy with a heavy heart. He writes to say, I am acknowledging that a season of my life is over. You see, there are times in our lives when seasons and doors close. They don't close because we're finished. They close because another door is opening. Another season is coming along. 
And so as people, we need to learn that when one season closes, we need to close the door so we can move on onto the next season. A season closing doesn't mean that you don't matter. A season closing doesn't mean that what you are doing is not important. It doesn't mean that God is not on your side. It just merely means that there's a movement, there's a change, there's a shift. And Paul says, my season is closing. I'm about to embrace another. But before I step into this next season, let me tell you about the season that I was in. And so he says in verse 6, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering. So Paul likens himself to a drink offering. Now, if you go back to the Old Testament and the scriptures will be up on the screen, you would see that the drink offering was given alongside the grain and the meat offering or the animal sacrifices. And so they would get to the temple and you'd bring your grain and you'd offer it to the Lord or your animal. And towards the end of that period, or when the grain had completely burnt up, or the animal was completely consumed by fire, the priest would take the drink offering, which was a mixture of wine and oil, scented oil, and he would pour it over that sacrifice. Now, this drink offering had two purposes. One, it was to prevent the grain from smelling like burnt popcorn. It was to prevent the meat or the animal from smelling like a bride that has gone wrong. And so he would pour that mixture, that aromatic mixture of oil and wine over the sacrifice so that as the, as the, the fire was burning out, a sweet fragrance, a sweet aroma would go up to God. You would read in the Old Testament every time the prophets would write to bring a sacrifice that is pleasing unto God. That aroma is what made the sacrifice in the temple sweet. So Paul is saying, I feel like I'm being poured out as a drink offering. So my season that has ended is a glorious season. My season that has ended is a season that God is well pleased of. But the second thing it played was that it ended the sacrifice. That this is it. I've given my best. I've given my all. Paul says, that's how I feel. I feel like God is pleased with what I've done. And guess what? I have given everything that I could give. But Paul says, I need you to understand something. I have a resume, and this is what I've done in that season. So he says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And as I talk to those of you who come from God first, you can proudly say that you fought the good fight of faith in Midrand. You remain true to the gospel. You love the city. Right to the end, just as you did on day one. No one could ever accuse you from straying from Jesus Christ. But not only did you fight a good fight, you kept the faith. We know in Joburg, everyone's after the soft life, right? So then they go after a soft Jesus. When people wondered after the the soft Jesus, you guys kept the faith. You continually called people to repentance and to sacrificial living based on the cross, based on what Jesus Christ did. So I want to say to you, well done for keeping the faith in challenging times. But the third thing Paul says is, I've finished the race. The issue in life is not whether you, it's not about how you start. It's just that you do start. Too often we hear in Job, a guy says, I'm going to start a business one day. One day when I'm rich, shut up and start the business already. The issue is about starting. But even better than starting is being able to finish. So last year I had the opportunity to go down to Comrades Marathon. 
And as we were watching the runners along the routes, we saw all manner of runners. Tall runners, short runners, quick runners, slow runners. But everybody was in the race. They all started, right? But what's great about comrades is when you are at Moses Mabida Stadium at the finish line. And all the runners, short, tall, quick, slow, after 90 kilometers of painful running, and I know some of you have done comrades, right? Some of you are veterans. So you're getting that feeling even now. You see smiles on their faces. Why? Because they finished. They finished the race. Some finished with tears on their eyes. Some finished hobbling, but they finished. And they were happy because they finished. Here's the thing about finishing. We need to finish our season so that we can fully embrace the next season in our lives. And so we've gone through a transition. We're going through a transition. It's to say we've done a good job. We've kept the faith. Now we close that season and embrace a new season. But here's the thing about Cumbridge runners. At the end of the race, when the race was finished, even if somebody was in pain, some people finished like this. I heard the following words from most runners. See you next year. See you next year. And I was like, are you crazy? See you next year. That says to me, though the race is finished, you are not finished. Though the season is finished, you are not finished. So Paul says to Timothy, though my life is about to end, the gospel work has not stopped. It has to continue because this is much bigger than you and me. And this is the call to all of us this morning. That until Jesus Christ comes back, we are called to finish. We are called to the mission of the gospel. Dare I say that the fact that you're here this morning is testament to God being at work in you. To say to you, the fact that you're here signifies that you're still on mission regardless of the nature of the vehicle. Yes, you might have changed addresses, you might have changed names, but the mission continues. It says that you're still convinced that God works through the local church. But before I speak of a new season, I want to address those of you whose address is not changing. You see, yeah, we might be gaining something, but the truth is we're also losing something familiar. And that should also be acknowledged. And so to all of us, as we enter the season, Colossians 3 and 12 would serve us very well because it says, as we live together, let's be gentle tender, kind, humble, patient towards each other. Why do I say that? Because as we become knit together, we'll all have an opportunity to be offended, all of us. Trust me, it happens. If I get offended at home, I will definitely get offended at church. <laughs> but even right here in our text, Paul urges us, he encourages us, he says, you, Timothy, have self-control. One of the things that's remarkable about this church, and that was remarkable about God first, was that we had all manner of people who weren't the same worshiping God together. I want you to take a moment and look around you. I'm serious, look around you. There are people who are different from you. We have vanilla people, we have chocolate people. We have people who have different cultures, young and old, yet we are here under the ban of Jesus Christ. But not just that, we do life together. And God has blessed God first in that space, He's blessed True North in that space, and if we don't get offended, that will be a beacon of hope for our city, a beacon of hope for our nation. 
that diverse people can come together, not just to Sunday together, but do every single day to the glory of God. And that is important in a country like ours. If you don't understand that, we can go for coffee later. And so we have to fight for unity at all levels. I'm saying it today on day one, that we have to fight for unity on all levels. We need to love each other well. Will it be easy? No. But love, Scripture says, covers a multitude of sins. And so the rest of the passage that Paul writes to Timothy is instructive to us as a new church, as a church that's moving together forward in union. Because in this season, God still says to us, we are on mission. And some of you might say, but we've been on mission all along. What's changed? Growing up, there was a cartoon that I used to watch, Pinky and the Brain. How many of you know that? <laughs> I can see all my chocolate people don't know. <laughs> all my vanilla people stood up. My chocolate people are like, what are you talking about? <laughs> just you and me, sister, just you and me. The coconuts are saying, yeah, it's fine, that's okay. <laughs> and so Pinky and the Brain was uh, a WWB uh, Warner Brothers cartoon. And in it, Pinky would ask the Brain every single episode, Brain, what are we going to do today? And without missing a beat, Brain's answer was the same every single time. We're going to take over the world, Pinky, just like we always do. And so to the Christian, we are called to take over the world for Jesus Christ. That's our mission. Old season, new season, we have one mission. We don't ask, what do we do in the season, new season? Jesus says, take over the world. Matthew 28 doesn't change. And so we are called into a new season but the mission remains the same. We're still on mission to make much of Jesus. And so he says in verse 2, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and teaching. For the time will come when people will not tolerate sound doctrine, but according to their own desires will multiply teachers for themselves because they have an itch to hear what they want to hear. They'll turn away from hearing the truth and will turn aside to myths. But as for you, exercise self-control in everything. You see, as all of us look at Midrand, we see a world that is broken. We see a people that are distressed and dispirited. A people that are in need of a savior. And God says to us, Christians don't just sit around and talk about it. Christians go out and they preach to the world. They tell those people who are in need of a Savior about the Savior, Jesus Christ. And I see a lot of heads nodding this morning, so we all understand this, that we are called to preach Jesus, right? But how many of us know that we only want to preach Jesus when it's convenient for us? I only want to tell my colleagues about Jesus because they asked me something about Jesus. I only want to tell my colleagues about Jesus because maybe they are going through a crisis moment. I never want to talk about Jesus just on my own. Just in case they reject me. Just in case they don't like me. But Paul says, preach the word of God in season and out of season. Whether it's favorable or it's not favorable. Go ahead and do what you are called to do. Being on mission calls us to be extra vigilant. We find ourselves in a season and in a time where there are many truths out there. People embrace the truth that they think is relevant for their lives at certain times in their lives. You'd have colleagues who say, to, to, yesterday I believed in Amazlozi. Today I believe in something else. And tomorrow I will believe in affirmations. They change like the wind. So as Christians, we need to be vigilant and be aware as the world turns to myths so we can give them the full truth of the gospel. 
And none of us can do all of that on our own. That's why we have come together. We have come together to be a safe harbor for people who are in spiritual turmoil, for people who are wandering on the seas of spiritism. We have come together to be a place where the hustlers of Joburg can find rest. We've come together to be on mission for Jesus. That's our call. That's the work we're called to do out there. But as I said earlier, we don't just have a work out there to do. There's a work that we need to do in here as well. Because we need to be united and together so we can do the work out there. God calls us. He challenges us to love each other. Why? Because in the text, Paul says, endure suffering. Suffering will come. But if we love each other, we can bear the suffering together. We can uphold each other because our brothers and our sisters are under distress. It's not your church, my church. No, it's our church. My brother, my sister. If as a church we need to fast on your behalf, we do it because we love you. And that's what we are being called to. The writer of Ecclesiastes says this about people who are united. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their hard work. If either should fail, one can pick up the other. But how miserable are those who fall and don't have a companion to help them. Also, if two lie together, they can stay warm. But how can anyone stay warm alone? Also, one can be overpowered, but two together can put up resistance. A three-ply cord cannot be easily snapped or broken. That's why. Because mission requires partnership. As I conclude, and you realize I close a number of times in the sermon. Back to verse 1. It says, I solemnly charge you before God and Christ Jesus, who's going to judge the living and the dead, and because of his appearing and his kingdom. See, some of us this morning might have the mistaken thought that we've come together to be bigger. No. That's not a re reason. That's not a good enough reason. We've come together because Jesus is coming back. And he says that he's going to judge. And if we say we love this city, our hearts should bleed for the city. Ah, up. We should be on our knees crying and praying for the city. Saying, God, before your judgment comes, we want to do your work. That's why we are here together. So that much is made of Jesus. We're stronger together because the gospel can come from a strong place when we are united. So as I conclude again, it could be that your heart is hurting from this past season. And that's real. I don't want you to deny that. It could be that you're anxious for the season that lies ahead. And I think that's everyone, right? That's okay. Because you're in God's house. And in God's house, there will be healing and there will be opportunity to grow and do new things again. When you're in God's house, you have brothers and sisters who have, who have a capacity to deal with your hurt, to help you with your anxiety and what you worry about concerning the future. Here's my prayer as your pastor. That all of us would embrace this season that we're embarking on, full of faith, full of expectation, and saying, God, what can you do? Because we've decided to join hands. God, would you use us to do something fruitful in the city, 
to bring revival in the city, not just for our church, but for all the churches in the city, that Christ might be known to those who are far from him. That is my prayer, that we would get behind one another for God's glory and the good of Midrand. But let him be glorified. We are better together. We are stronger together.